old. And some of the poems I haven't written down on paper, but last night I was thinking about this one. And the title of this show, my paintings, my poetry, everything, is, and the beat goes on, still crazy after all these years. So here is the deal. When I was little, Is it okay? Are you going to, is this get censored or can I just talk the way I normally talk? Okay, good. Some fortunate souls are born to be artists. Oh, when I was uh, just really young and I was drawing on the walls of the house I lived in, the woman that gave birth to me uh, left the moment I was born and I didn't see her till I was eight. But then uh, <laughs> I found out my passion for drawing and carrying on like that, really when I went to my birth mother at eight, I was drawing on the walls all over the house just to piss her off. And, uh, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> Rennick Stevenson is one of those souls. I draw on anything, everything, napkins, tabletops, all kinds of stuff, bathroom walls. I ask people when I go to restaurants or, or, or record stores or anything like that, is it okay if I do some drawing on your walls in the bathroom? And uh, they often say yes, so. Life is his canvas. His tools are. Whatever's handy. You know, I've, I've drawn and painted with the damnedest things in the world because I was in jail or in prison or in the funny farm and I couldn't get my art supplies. And so I had to make do and sometimes it was ketchup and sometimes it was whatever, you know. But uh, it works. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> I like the images that come out of my hand, head, and heart, and I don't, I don't run that. I don't have an agenda. I've tried that for a long time to try and plan art. So much for that. And every time I did, I had to tear up the paper or paint it out or whatever and start over again because I wasn't paying attention. In fact, it was that guy, uh, Clifford Still. He was my first major art teacher back in the 50s in San Francisco. And uh, he came up to me the first day of class. I was working on a big canvas and it, I was trying to make it happen. And he came up and he took a big brush with some gesso on it, he just did a big swash over what I started. And I looked at him, what the fuck? You know, and he said, boy, we got to teach you how to color outside the lines. And the light went on because that's part of the whole beat thing, coloring outside the lines. And that's what makes a successful piece of art, whether it's a dance or music or painting or whatever it is, sculpture, all any art form, because that's all living. <laughs> People like my paintings because I paint from my balls, paint from my heart, not my mind. I paint, I paint and write my life out. My poems are about life. And if my heart and soul is right, I'll be shown why I bother. My, my painting's about life. I make everything I say or do be an art form, a natural art form, just pure right to the heart and soul. And that's all I've ever had is my art, you know? 
So you got to be a good steward of your gift. Pass it on. I don't know if <laughs> I'm not going to get any taller, that's for sure. <laughs> a rich like me. Just very simple. It's about everything you do that I do, that anybody does. Connected to earth and sky. Living your life creatively is the highest form of art. I uh, I got clean and sober December 28th, 1977. All my drinking and drugging days, I was a Jekyll and Hyde. My art would be really wonderful and my behavior would be just, you know, like that. And uh, it made no sense at all. Uh, it's how I treated the world. The reason that I ended up uh, starting to think about getting sober was that uh, my oldest boy had suicided uh, the spring of 77. And I found out that Joey had killed himself. Mm two days before his 21st birthday. And he did it on uh, peyote and, uh, and tequila. And he drowned himself in a lake just outside of Seminole, Oklahoma, where I was born. And uh, he didn't think anybody loved him. And he just wanted, because I'd left him when he was three. and. Uh, Anyway, I'd like to say I quit drinking because of that. Next thing I knew, I realized that I was just healthy enough to live another 10 or 15 years, and it was going to get worse. So I didn't kill my, I mean, I didn't go into treatment because of Joey killing himself. I went in treatment because I was a coward and I couldn't handle any more pain. The basic principle in diagnosing alcoholism and drug addiction is selfishness, self-centeredness, self-seeking, and self-pity. And that's how I'd lived my whole life. <laughs> I call my higher power holy shit because my higher power came to me when I was in detox and said uh, she was with my son. I said, Joey, what can I do, man? I can't bring you back to life that he wasn't 21 yet because when you kill yourself, you stay what age you were then. And he was uh, almost 21. And I said, I can't bring you back to life. And he used a uh, an almost 21 phrase, he said, no, duh. And I said, okay, smart ass, what can I do? And he said, what you do is you work with kids at risk, you work with everybody and tell them to love themselves and to love others. And uh, that there's a lot of love and it may not come from where you want it to, but it's there for you. Love and truth is the only way. That's what I've been doing. In my sobriety, not only was I a good painter, but St. Luke's had me, had, been work, had me working there, and we started the first Outward Bound program and everything for alcoholics and addicts. And I really got locked into it, and I quit smoking cigarettes, and I was running ultra marathons and climbing mountains and taking patients to the mountains and all this stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, I couldn't do any of that anymore. Rennick was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, as well as a mild form of Alzheimer's. 
I have trouble walking. I have trouble talking. I can't use a computer anymore because my fingers do this dumbass dance. But that obstacle has only made him focus more. Well, I was told that I was terminal. And while I was still in the hospital over that, I just had a flash from what my great uncle had taught me about rodeo. I, I rodeoed from the time I was a young kid till I was a, an adult, till I was 27, and that's when I, had, I made the mistake of getting on the back of a bareback bronc drunk. And I got kicked in the face, pronounced dead, shattered my palate. That's why I've been wearing these since 20, I was 27. <laughs> my whole face had been destroyed. He said, boy, he says, uh, life's a bull ride. You're going to have challenges all the time. And he was getting me up out of the middle of a practice arena. And he was dusting me off when he talked to me. He started walking away. And he says, uh, you can handle anything for eight seconds. When you get old, you're going to find out you're going to get a bunch of damn eight seconds all in a row. And it may last you for years. But what you do is you just keep a tired arm, a strong ass, and a good heart. <laughs> so it's living every moment and just be ready to go or have a good time and make sure your motives are right in anything you say or do. I think that he's a source of inspiration. And the, the life that was, was led um, boggles my mind on a regular basis. And so it's always good to see another little piece of his soul. And the bottom line for that is very simple. You know, we tend to complicate wet dreams. But the bottom line to that is uh, you look at it, and if you don't like how it's working, you paint it out and start it over again. I'm exactly what I always wanted to be right now. And I know this is going to go on a desk, and some really strange people are going to be watching this shit. And they're going, my god, that guy's crazy. You're absolutely right, folks. I'm crazy as an outhouse rat. And that's why the name of my show is And the Beat Goes On Still Crazy After All These Years. I sing. Thank you all very much. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed